Welcome, everybody. It's just one o'clock now in the Pacific time zone here in Canada. Uh, I'm Bill Code, of course, and this is Christina Mitz. Hi. Who's my uh, colleague, and she works as a, a therapist in the Tamount Canada Clinic, which does gut floral transplant, among other things, to enhance your well being. So, what we wanted to do today, I wanted to go over a little bit about things opening up. Because happily in British Columbia now, as of I think a week's time, they're going to open the parks. Hooray. I think that's great. And they're going to open a number of other services. Mm. So your understanding, you know, that's dental offices and physiotherapists, chiropractors, and quite a lot of other entities, as long as they have, you know, careful selective distancing and so on. So, and I think that means that, you know, by the middle of May, you know, we could be well open again at Tame Out Clinic. Perfect. Okay. So I had an interesting talk yesterday with the folks in in Britain who, of course, started the initial Tame Out Clinic. And they, like us, are currently closed. COVID-19 has them, has them very frightened mm. in the UK. They now have the most deaths of anywhere on the, in Europe. Oh, wow even though they're not the largest country. And we can have some things out of that. When we think about it, I mean, the other thing I, I was lucky enough to review in the last couple of days is that your chances of dying, if you're less than 65, now I'm over that, so it doesn't apply, but less than 65 years old, if you live in Germany, your risk of dying from COVID-19 is no more than your risk of dying in a car accident on your way to and from work. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much in perspective. It's not, so you're 70 times, you know, less likely to die of COVID-19 if you're under 65. So it's not foolproof. And of course, bets are partially off if you have a major illness or right. compromising problem. Mm -hmm. It isn't as rosy once we get over to you know, across the water, and most of the data is from the United States, uh, it's sometimes 15 times less likely if you're under 65. And so I think that's partly because we're not as healthy. Right. As most Europeans, we don't exercise as much, we eat too much of the wrong things, almost no glyphosate over there, and I think it's a huge factor in our well-being. And the other subtlety I think no one's thought about in the beast in the Great Britain, the United Kingdom scenario, is they're even further north than you and I live. We live about the 49th parallel, and they're mm -hmm. closer to 51 to 53. And so they have much less vitamin D. Right. And lack of vitamin D is just a huge marker to how badly you will do with COVID-19 because it's a, such a big part of our immune system and well-being. Yeah. So the other things that you know i read more and more about it as i'm sh sure you have too they injected on the 12th of march a person in seattle with a vaccine for COVID 19. but before you get really excited about that i want you to understand what that particular vaccine has in it it has a piece of rna protein which goes in and changes our dna mm -hmm. So it's effectively a genetic engineering principle. And many of you have heard about genetic engineering before. I mean, you know, it's beyond the scope of our discussion here to talk about all of it. But we do know it's been done for 20, 30, 40 years. But we also know that it's not near as precise as we'd like to think it is. Right. So if you give it to a thousand people, there may be several in that thousand that it really puts them on a not too great curve. So do we want to risk taking a, and the reason they could do that sooner is because almost all the components of manufacture of that vaccine are done inside our own body. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to rely on, you know, a whole set of companies and what we're going to add to it as far as an adjuvant like um, aluminum or formaldehyde or some other variation or what other cells it's been, but we do have to worry that's changing me genetically long-term so that it's there also in my offspring. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that 
has always upset me with genetic engineering. A, it's not precise, and B, it's unpredictable, and C, it's with you long term, you know, multiple generations. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I've reiterated a couple times before, my preference, even though I'm over 65, is to get COVID-19 personally mm -hmm. and develop my own ability to handle it. And so make myself tip top, have that vitamin D ahead of time, have adequate intake, of course, of vitamins A and B and C, and have extra C around and take it during this whole time, maybe for this next six months until we think we've been exposed to the virus. And then to have extra C to take, maybe even every 10, 20 minutes, if I think I've got COVID-19, and, and take it from there. And then the other subtleties we've mentioned is, is measuring your oximeter, you know, your pulse oximeter measurement, which is just that finger clip. And that's now been used in Ireland as well as on Vancouver Island here in Canada as a mode of checking people out at home. Because people have continued to state, if you can stay home for this illness, it's much better than being anxious and going to hospital. Because the hospitals, you know, they've got their set of sick people already, and then it's relatively hard to keep the COVID-19 cases from transmitting it through there and or through the healthcare workers. So that the more we can do at home with our vitamin C, our pulse oximeter, and what other old modalities we might use. Remember, I'm still a big fan of natokinase, mm -hmm. okay, because of the COVID toll. Yep. Such a neat term, COVID toll. I'm sure that's going to catch on. People talk about it lots. But what it effectively means is in the excess clotting aggravated by the COVID-19, you get effectively a blood clot to the artery supplying that finger or toe. And then you have COVID toe or rashes thereof, or as well documented already, people having strokes in their 30s and 40s. Right. So way ahead. Well, I can tie the vaccine, um, the vaccine piece into the microbiome piece, which we're going to be talking mm -hmm. about more later on. And I have cataloged some research that has shown um, that the state of your microbiome can predispose or protect you from vaccine related injury. Well, sure, because it, it can protect you from almost any injury mm -hmm. because it's optimizing your immune system function. It's optimizing the entry through the lining of the gut, you know, so-called healing the leaky membrane. I mean, and you and I are, are fortunate because we both had GFT for our respective issues and challenges. Um, and I think that makes us more prepared for this risk factor right. because we know our immune systems better than it once was. Mm -hmm. Now, not everybody's going to have that advantage or an opportunity but at least we can use the principles and we can move forward because as we keep saying, a large number of fruits and vegetables, different ones, not all the same ones, you know, eating corn three times a day and peas three times a day, it's not going to solve everything. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, as recently as a decade ago, I still meet people that, you know, yeah, I eat lots of vegetables, like corn, peas, carrots, and potatoes. And potatoes, yeah. In <laughs> fact, if, if we took potatoes off the list, I think the average amount of intake in, in the U.S. of, of uh, vegetables is 1.4. And if you take out French fries out of that, potatoes, it's about 0.4, you know, because <laughs> potatoes is a rescue. Um, but it's that diversity of vegetables. We just finished planting some garden, put some more seeds in the ground, and so now we've got red dandelion in the mix and we've mm. got chicory in the mix and so we're tr trying to really diversify that groups and we've already got you know dried beans and ordinary yellow beans and purple beans and green beans and all these other pieces so that you get that diversity. right because remembering and that matters for SIBO too okay SIBO small intestine bacterial overgrowth which we focused on a lot the other day and we're going to do more nuances on it today um it's a lack of diversity and it's an overgrowth of a number of pathogenic type bacteria. So pathogenic bacteria, just to remind you, is a particular subset of that bacteria, which is a real big problem. So in Clostridium group, 
you think of C. difficile or C. diff as it's commonly called, most Clostridium are just fine. And even having a few C. diff bacteria is not a crisis if you've got that big diversity among the other Clostridia as well as among all of the other groups. And the same pathogenic groups that we talk about, um, I think the three big ones in SIBO are uh, E. coli, the nasty group. Klebsiella. Klebsiella. Um, Aeromonas. And Aeromonas. Mm -hmm. Aeromonas is a new one to me. It, it's different than Pseudomonas. I've you know, mm -hmm. done that from the other notes that you created. Um, so it's those groups. And if we can diversify. And so one of our questions the other day from Bruce was, was helpful because it made us think more about because we've always asked people to get their SIBO solved before they came for gut floral transplant. And another modality might be is working with their clinician, or if they're well versed on their own with what they read, to do all the pieces to calm their SIBO as best they can. And then with their clinician, have treatment of the SIBO a few days off, and then start your gut floral transplant. Mm -hmm. It makes a huge amount of sense to me because in SIBO also, just because you knock out some of the fairly not, you don't knock them out completely, but you really diminish some of those pathogenic bacteria. But now you're supplying a new set of teams mm -hmm. to choose from. And yes, you're putting it in through the rectum, but it travels up and it travels throughout the body. After you got floral transplant, all parts of the body uh, flora are, are shifted, even in the mouth. Right. And when we do our consultations with people, if they are inquiring about GFT and they themselves have had a history of SIBO, I do try to go through as many of the different root causes as possible so I can kind of weigh out the cost or benefit for them. Um, and if it sounds like there might be a root cause, a, a major one or two that haven't been addressed, I will suggest that. Well, for sure. And so that's why, you know, it's a really good place to start. You may not be ready or don't know if you're ready for GFT. So fine, start consultation with Christina or a colleague, Cindy. You know, they're both really well versed. I'm really impressed with how much knowledge they've picked up in the last couple of years. Uh, Christina is now an instructor for the Tame Out Clinic uh, Therapist Program, which is outstanding because now we've got that here in North America. Um, we don't have to necessarily go over to the UK. That was the other thing my friends reminded me of. Flights aren't very common yet. Mm. They have a, a client who had treatment of their, with their gut floral transplant a month, six weeks ago. They're still staying in the UK. They can't get a flight home. Mm. And they have another um, colleague who is going to work with them in their clinic uh, physician. And he's still stuck in Los Angeles. Oh. He can't get a flight to the UK. <laughs> So there's not many things going around and to and fro. And I, I don't know where you live, but I think almost all countries aren't doing much interchange at the minute. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when that will open up. Um, I was talking to Piper earlier today. This is a mutual friend of ours. And, and uh, she thought maybe by the end of May. Well, I, gee, I hope so. Mm -hmm. But they're also saying Europe is hoping to have a onset of tourism again by summer. And others are saying, well, not going to happen maybe, because they may not be able to get there. Well, I know our First Nations communities here don't want the tours in the summer because they consider themselves to be more susceptible. So, Yeah, and it may be true. Some subsets sets may be more susceptible. And the other tough part about our First Nations is they, they tend to be a, you know, lower set of food choices, you know, right. because they're economically disadvantaged or poorer, frankly. And you know, poverty is a big risk factor for getting a rough case of COVID-19 because you're not as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you've got all those stresses of what you're going to eat next or how you're going to feed your kids or any of these other pieces, then the anxiety and the fear suppresses your immune system and you're doubly hooped. The other encouraging thing, though, is people are starting to relax with the idea of maybe going back. Because initially, some people were quite fearful and I knew we had to get past that because and that's why my goal is to reassure people I mean we've got a lot of good numbers now from different parts of the world not just a county in California but then you know the group in I think it was Bakersfield 
the physicians that spoke out there testing. And then of course, the numbers that we've done in, in New York, you know, five to 20% of the whole population already have COVID-19. So it's around a lot more than you think it is. You just haven't had it in a big enough dose or amount to be a problem. Okay, so, so that's really encouraging. Um, and the death rate is way down. You know, they always use the number and the big thing that's changed now is we're getting a bigger denominator, we're getting a bigger lower number, so that the death rate is anywhere from 0 0.05 to 0.1%, maybe as high as 0.2%. If you're, you know, a healthcare worker, or have some health challenges. Okay, well, that's a different scheme of things. But if you're healthy and well, it's quite small and right down in the range of a flu virus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and just, I talked a little bit about the, excuse me, pending vaccines in the early case, but just to remind you, you know, we've had hepatitis C for 30, 40 years now. And it's an RNA virus, as is COVID-19. But we still don't have a vaccine for it. Mm. We still do not have a successful vaccine for an RNA virus. Okay. Okay. So SARS, which was, I think, 2002, 2003, um, which is what's COVID-1, and this is theoretically COVID-2, um, we still don't have a vaccine for that. And we don't have one for the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS which was pretty lethal in high numbers, but we still don't have a vaccine for those. Mm -hmm. um, so the likelihood that we're going to have an awesome, comprehensive, safe vaccine is further reduced because that was what the, the microbiologist colleague that I talked to in the UK says there's 28 strains so far. Okay. Because the COVID-19 is mutating at a very rapid rate. Consequently, your best protection is being well yourself. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's one of the reasons we're doing these is to empower you as individuals or as clinicians or both to do the things that you can to, to help your own health. Because that's the secret of integrated medicine, functional medicine, is what are the pieces that you can do for yourself? And any clinician, I mean, I'm long in the tooth for over 40 years, realizes that if people aren't working at helping themselves, they're not going to do so great. Mm -hmm. We don't have that much magic in our fingers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So why did we, um, we, we started to talk a little bit about uh, the different components within SIBO. And maybe you could outline those again and even talk about one of the trickier ones to treat, the sulfite group. So just kind of put them in a pattern and then also reassure you, we're going to put on our, uh, my website, drbillco.com, there will be more detail about SIBO mm -hmm. because my book, Solving the Brain Puzzle, talks a lot about the microbiome and so on, but there's much, much less on the SIBO concept because it's relatively newer and it's being worked out a little bit better every day. Mm -hmm. So we try to go to some of the ways to calm down your SIBO by things that you could change at home. And now why don't we spend a bit of time on you know, the, either the herb or the antibiotic choices, which exactly. kind of need to be a bit selective, and then how you could find out which one to go to. Exactly. So I'll just reiterate, there are three types of SIBO. We have the hydrogen dominant SIBO, we have methane dominant, and then we have the third type, which is hydrogen dominant. So you really want to know which... Hydrogen sulfide. Yeah, yeah hydrogen sulfide. You want to know which one you have in order to um, make the best make the best treatment choice for yourself or to help your practitioner make the best treatment choice for you um so i mean number one is still the breath test i know we talked about last time how um we're starting to question the fact that the breath test is still the gold standard and that combining that with microbiome testing can often be really 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 revealing so i mean first and foremost still you're going to do the breath test you're going to find out if you have hydrogen or methane dominance and then you can make some um, treatment choices based on that so um, if you find out your hydrogen dominant the standard treatment is with rifaximin and you might combine that with prokinetics or um, 
partially hydrolyzed guar gum or just keeping, make sure that you have um, fiber intake happening while you are taking the rifaximin to wake up the bacteria. So, and just to fill that out for you, you will need a prescription for the rifaximin. Mm. And that's important too, because you may need a prescription for your uh, prokinetic too. And then, you know, and maybe at the end of, you know, once we get through the antibiotic herbal portion, then we'll talk a little bit about the prokinetics because that matters. And remember last time's tip, magnesium, great thing for bowel constipation and such. It's not a prokinetic. Mm -hmm. And then type number two, methane. If you go the antibiotic route, you're probably gonna end up using rifaximin and neomycin or some other similar combination. And again, you'll probably end up taking a prokinetic. And then with this one, I also find it helpful to include the partially hydrolyzed guar gum um, as it does help reduce methanogens. Methanogens being bacteria that produce methane. Right. Okay, so it's kind of a subset group. And it's actually, it's archaea. So, um, we what have- What is archaea? Yeah. Because not everybody knows <laughs> to know that it is. Yeah, so archaea are actually, they're single-celled organisms um, as well. We can't actually call them bacteria. And uh, it's for that reason that um, the name, if someone has methane-dominant SIBO, the name for that is actually SIMO, S-I-M-O now, because it's um, it's due to these methanogens. So Nice to have a new acronym. Yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and then with the hydrogen sulfide, because it's newer, there's less, there's been fewer conclusions about how to treat this one. Um, and it seems to be that the experts are saying this is the one where you kind of need to be more um, specific according to which microbial overgrowth you have. So um, I know vancomycin is kind of the top recommended antibiotics for it, but there we have a whole list of um, maybe five or six antibiotics and you would choose the one based on which type of microbial overgrowth you had. And so you would want to use some form of microbiome testing to find that out. Um, so you might use something like Thrive, which does test for a lot of the commensal and um, beneficial microbes as well as some of the pathogens. Unfortunately, it doesn't test for all of the pathogens. Um, there's really no middle ground with the microbiome testing yet. It's really, it's kind of frustrating. Well, we're um, still at a pretty new stage. Yeah. <laughs> and so for those who want to be thorough, I actually recommend utilizing two types of microbiome testing. So I would say use Thrive and use one of the ones that's more specific towards pathogens, like the GI map or GI effects, um, because those ones will pick up on E. coli, Prevotella, and some of the other species that Thrive doesn't pick up on, but they don't pick up on everything that Thrive does pick up on. So um, if you're going to be really thorough, use them both. And even to do those steps, you're, you're going to need the assistance of a you know knowledgeable clinician or a consultation with someone like Christina, because it's not for the regular mortal easy to figure out. Mm -hmm. um, a side way of, for me, thinking about archaea that might help some of you, it helped me, I think of it as a little bit like an amoeba. Okay, so that's a single celled organism, it's, but it, it's not in the bacteria class, it's not in the fungi class, it's in its own subset. And that's a normal part of our microbiome, just as all these other components, viruses and fungi and, and bacteria are part of our microbiome. We have that normal mix, diversity is all the better. So one way I'm sure you're thinking about to minimize the archaea is to have really healthy diversity of all the other subsets. Because nature is always much better at controlling a portion of one that's off the map excess, nature is going to do a better job usually than you and I trying to figure out which shotgun to use against it, i.e. an antibiotic um, or that other version. And I guess archaea isn't sensitive to most antibiotics or maybe none. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, maybe one way we really have to focus then on, on diet, right? So mm -hmm. what kind of diet would you really try and work hard at? 
Well, for the hydrogen sulfide, we would recommend reducing um, your intake of certain types of sulfur. So some of, depending on which microbe you have overgrown, um, quite a few of them feed on cysteine. So I'd recommend reducing cysteine in the diet. Um, also, if they tend to be, um, if you have overgrowth of the microbes that are bile tolerant or bile loving, then you're gonna wanna reduce your intake of things that actually stimulate bile production, such as a high fat diet, um, or even certain cholagogues. So like the plant things that uh, stimulate bile production. So that would be something like um, fennel or even ginger, depending on your sensitivity to those things. And, and you could bring down your sulfur intake, sulfur containing mm -hmm. foods. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to be careful because some of them are really healthy, but legumes, exactly. most of you know that if you eat a lot of you know, canned beans, some of you will get a huge boost in smelly farts, for lack of a better term. And, you know, that's the boost that's happening. So think of you're going to want to, for a time, bring down the beans, probably even bring down the uh, brassicas, you know, cauliflower, broccoli, mm -hmm. and so on. Not long term, but in the short term, while you're trying to get the archaea group back into normal formation so that you don't have excess formation um, of hydrogen sulfide, then you're going to be on that side. One of the interesting ones that I came across in reference to the hydrogen sulfide is that sulforaphane um, can actually help in some cases reduce desulfovibrio, which is one of the archaea that produces hydrogen sulfide. And so you wouldn't want to reduce sulforaphane from your diet, but you're, there's only going to be select few things that you would get it from, and that would be broccoli sprouts and they have to be raw. Um, so if you cook anything with sulforaphane in it, it depletes it. Okay, breaks mm -hmm. it down. Yeah, so knowing which one you're going to and so, you know, maybe you can negate that. You can have, because probably it's working on the pathway of it, because the NERF2, NRF2 pathway really makes a difference, you know, anti-cancer and all kinds of important things. And that's why they're really important to have in your diet. Mm -hmm. I would also include molybdenum. Um, as as a supplement uh, to help reduce your own endogenous production of sulfur. So molybdenum is interesting. So it's a trace mineral. And so one way to, and I highly recommend this, if you're on a journey to health, you might well consider getting a hair metal analysis mm -hmm. because it does not just the heavy metals, which we're used to, you know, mercury and lead and cadmium and, and aluminum, but it also does the trace minerals. So the trace minerals that you want to know about, one is a molybdenum, another is selenium, another is iodine. It'll, you know, fill in the, some of the others, even lithium, mm -hmm. because some parts of the world are very low in those things. Mm -hmm. I, I've measured a lot of hair analysis on here on the West Coast, and it seems it's much like selenium. I mean, I learned about that when I moved out here mm -hmm. because our animals were short of selenium. So all the food products for your cows and and horses or emus, whatever you were growing, needed selenium added to it because it washes, rinses through the soil. And I think probably the same happens to molybdenum and lithium and so on. So molybdenum is interesting also because you can buy it in an over-the-counter food preparation. It's a very small number of molybdenum that you would be taking, but that molybdenum it does at least four pathways in the body. And the one that I reference all the time in my MS patients is I determine what is their uric acid concentration. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to see if they have gout or not because gout is incredibly uncommon in that population. The reason being is many of those people are short of uric acid and they're short of uric acid because molybdenum is needed in the pathway of forming uric acid. And uric acid, of course, is the human, monkey, and guinea pig uh, source as a primary antioxidants because we don't make vitamin C. So we don't make vitamin C, uric acid is even more critical. So when they've got a very low uric acid, I typically have them try molybdenum because that often brings it up. And, that's, and it's available in your health food store. And so it's, it's one more thing to think about. And if you're uncertain about it, fine, get your hair tested and find out. Mm -hmm. The other thing that can help with hydrogen sulfide is actually increasing your fiber intake. So there are certain types of fiber that can help decrease the hydrogen sulfide. The only complicated bit happens if you have um, too much still 
hydrogen, just straight hydrogen dominance as well, because then increasing fiber too quickly might be might be problematic for you because you increase the hydrogen production and then the hydrogen sulfide producers take that hydrogen and they use it to make the hydrogen sulfide. So, I mean, if it's a really straightforward case, um, increasing your fiber, um, especially specific ones like poor man's ginseng can potentially help to reduce the hydrogen sulfide. But if you're a complicated case, you're probably going to need more assistance. So poor man's ginseng. Is that the one less expensive on the shelf or what is that? Uh, I have not found it to be less expensive, unfortunately. Well, it's not. Okay. So <laughs> it's probably a different form of ginseng. So you're going to need yeah. some advice on, on how to go with that. I mean, I can attest this. Having had SIBO, treated it, was better for a time, came back. And then I spent a very unpleasant day. We finally found in Buenos Aires in uh, January, we found a restaurant which was celiac friendly. Fantastic. So we really chowed down. This is at lunchtime. And I had a major spinach corn based pasta. Okay. Sounds good. So I ate too much of it and suffered for about eight, 10 hours mm -hmm. because I was, I guess, well, maybe I didn't handle corn well either because corn's not an uncommon problem. If you're already sensitive to casein, you know, from dairy and, and gluten, then you may be in the corn group too. And then there was a, I guess, a lot of fiber in that. So it flared up the SIBO big time. And so I'm still on that journey with SIBO. I did get an appointment. So sometime in the next one to three months, I'll have some surgery to get rid of that bladder stone, which means unfortunately intermittent urinary tract infections and intermittent antibiotics. And all of these really mess up your whole gut system, including your SIBO flare. Mm -hmm. But we'll get there. It's uh, it's a journey, this health business. It definitely is. You can't expect it to be over too quickly sometimes. Well, you know, it's a lifelong process. Yeah. And yeah. no one cares about it more than you do, I hope. Because our goal is to empower you to make show that you can make some differences, get some advice on your path, but get on the path. Not mm -hmm. getting on it, you're not going to get there. Mm -hmm. And then with the other two forms of SIBO, the hydrogen and the methane, you're probably going to end up doing a low FODMAP diet for at least a period of time while you treat it and maybe even potentially for a little while after treating it just to let things calm down a little bit. Um, it's important to remember that methane and hydrogen sulfide both depend on the hydrogen producers being there. Um, so the more hydrogen you have being produced, either the methane producers or the hydrogen sulfide producers are going to steal that hydrogen and take it for themselves. So um, definitely the low FODMAP diet can be helpful in a lot of cases. So not everybody knows FODMAP, you know, I got a feel for it. So why don't, why don't you give them a one or two line summary of what FODMAPs is? Right. Um, so essentially you're just decreasing your fiber intake, which is kind of anti everything that we've been saying this whole time. So you really have to make sure that it's for a set period of time um, and that you have a plan for coming off of that diet um, because it's not great for your microbiome to stay on a low, fi low fiber diet for longer than necessary. And if we pull apart the acronym, I think it stands for fructo oligo disaccharides. Mm -hmm. Okay. So disaccharide is, is table sugar, right? Mm -hmm. Sucrose, you know, so that's fructose and glucose. So that's a disaccharide. So the long chains, oligo, that means more than two. Um, and fructose, I don't like fructose. I mean, and I really, I don't mind fructose because it's in every fruit known to man effectively. Mm -hmm. But I really ask you avoid because I avoid uh, high fructose corn syrup. Mm -hmm. And then the P at the end is polyols, which is kind of like sugar alcohols. Sure. Um, well, we've got some questions, so we could dig into these. Bruce is asking, can you talk about the ileocecal valve and how it relates to, or how do you know if it's functioning normally and stuck open or closed? So to know that you would want to go to someone who specializes in visceral manipulation. You can look up a practitioner by going to www.theberalinstitute.com and go through their practitioner directory and make sure that the person has at least level one, hopefully even level two um, of the visceral manipulation training. And then even then it can still be a bit challenging to find someone who is quite good at it. I know I went through like five osteopaths before I found someone who okay. um, was actually So you want to it. find the skill set. So so maybe you could put that, you know, reference Liberal Institute 
in the notes because mm-hmm. um, it's often hard to remember it. Not everybody's writing down and, and so on. And now we're moving to make these audio podcasts as well. So I know you're not going to be writing down while you're driving in your car. I hope not. Um, just like texting, it's a disaster. Um, so to to work within that possibility is is a, is a good step. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I know and, that- sorry. And yeah. just to <laughs> remind people what the ileocecal valve is right at the end of the small intestine. So that's in imperial language 25 feet or so long and that's the entrance into the large intestine or large bowel okay and that happens right beside the appendix okay so that gives you orientation of where it is the ileocecal valve like most valves in the body it's not a perfect one-way valve and that it sounds perfect Mm -hmm. all the time but you know the body is all about biology and variability and so sometimes it's a degree of one wayness. I mean, if, if you put huge pressures inside the large bowel, so think colonoscopy and they're pumping in all this air so they can see things and visualize things better, well, that could easily push back on the valve and make it happen. So ideally, it's trying to protect the small bowel from large amounts of all the major bacterial groups and microbial groups within the large bowel going back up into the small intestine. So each one has its own optimal pH and they, the pH is very, just as if you go all the way up to the stomach, you know, the pH is really low, whereas it's much more basic in the large, in the small bowel. And, and then it's a pH of about five, I think in the large bowel. Mm-hmm. And then the other valve that we often talk about is right at the bottom of the esophagus. And that's where it goes into the stomach. And that's very much a physiologic valve. You know, we like to think of it as working as a perfect one-way valve, but it's not. It's much more a relative valve and it works sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. You can change the patency of that valve just by eating more fat. I learned this the hard way because I couldn't eat chocolate because I would get heartburn right after. But happily... My wife, Denise, you know, with her training in nutrition, had learned that the patency of that valve matters. So if I took a digestive enzyme, I could eat chocolate. Mm. So that was all good. And now, you know, I think because the microbiome has been relatively improved in myself, I think that valve works better. Because that valve working better reduces my risk of heartburn and all those other relative issues that you didn't want to happen. So I want you to think of the ileocecal valve as not a black and white phenomenon, but shades of gray, and you can help it along its route by having the optimal bacteria in the small intestine and the large intestine. Mm -hmm. So if you do see someone who specializes in visceral manipulation, they're just going to kind of have a really gentle feel in there. And if they feel that it's either stuck open or stuck stuck closed, they can put it back into place. And um, I know in my case, I only had to do that a couple times and then it kind of stuck for itself. But I was also doing other forms of treatment at the same time. There are nutrients that the ileocecal valve depends on. So um, like calcium and silica. And that would be another reason to do the hair tissue mineral analysis. Check your calcium levels. Um, there are other valves as well. We actually have multiple valves throughout the digestive tract. And again, in my case, when I was really sick with SIBO, um, it wasn't even the ileocecal valve that was most irritated. It was one of the other ones. And so going for visceral, visceral manipulation did help with that. Yeah. And, you know, the really important one is the emptying of the stomach. And of course, anything that reduces the migrating motor complex. So we mm-hmm. talked about that. So it's kind of the peristaltic waves that are going through the small intestine. But anytime that's interfered with, interfered with, then the valves are going to be challenged, either with excess effort that they have to do or reduced effort because it's not moving through. And a classic case I think I gave you the other day was the diabetic because things do not move through as well and that's why the diabetics are more at risk of SIBO I'm sure and other health issues because they things don't work as optimally because the nerve inputs aren't working as optimally and so things are diminished in flow and movement. Mm -hmm. Next question what do you think is the best best prokinetic? Well that is going to depend on the person and their needs. 
So if the person needs a really strong one and they prefer something prescription, you're probably going to start out with something like uh, Lin's S. And um, if you're looking for something a little less strong and you have the combination of maybe having an autoimmune condition, you might go with low dose naltrexone. Um, And if you're looking for something more herbal based, you might try um, one of the combination formulas. So there's one called Motil Pro, which contains ginger, B6 and a couple of other things. And if you're looking for something um, that has less ingredients, you could always try something like artichoke extract. Yeah. So, and the one other one was erythromycin, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So I remember when I was in first and general practice some 40 years ago, if we didn't use amoxicillin to treat an infection, then sometimes we used erythromycin. And it, it was quite effective, but one in... 50, one in a hundred people would get incredible abdominal cramps from mm. and say, I can't take that. They weren't truly allergic, but they were incredibly responsive to the so-called prokinetic. So when we use the erythromycin, we usually use the single dose, um, I think it's 250 milligrams, but it helps move things through. You know, I try to individualize it when I look at people, because if they maybe they've already got MS or chronic fatigue or history of Lyme or something, and I might be considering what I use low dose naltrexone for that, then I might start it as a prokinetic because it would have the prokinetic benefits. And I know there's some people say, well, LDN isn't enough. Well, maybe it isn't enough, but it might be enough to start the process for you. And then you can get by with some herbal things. I mean, I'm a huge fan of ginger too. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm only not addicted. I mean, semi addicted to the candy ginger, but you know, whichever, but ginger tea, ginger is just an outstanding entity for most of us. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how a lack of gallbladder affects your microbiome and what people who lack a gallbladder can take to help digestive enzymes, et cetera? Yeah. So that's a very good question because many, many people have had their gallbladders removed. Um, We've reiterated a way to prevent the gallbladder problem to some degree is reducing your glyphosate intake because it really messes up the liver and the formation of bile. So if you've already had the gallbladder removed, well, that's not an option. They don't put them back in. We don't do gallbladder transplants at this point in time. But what you can do is to try to to have a diet that is consistent with ongoing slow release of bile, because that's Mm -hmm. what the bile does. It can't store it in the gallbladder, which is literally a storage depot as much as anything. And then when you take in a fatty meal, it contracts down, squeezes bile in, and the bile helps digest things. So usually the liver, if healthy and well, you know, and I don't, so often anything that will make the liver improve in its health, you know, these are things like milk thistle and and, uh, that whole group of entities, improved liver health will make improved bile output. And then if that isn't enough, then you can go to digestive enzyme groups, which have added to them ox bile. Okay, so Mm -hmm. that's bile from a cow, which you're literally taking, and you would particularly take it if you're gonna have your fatty meal of the day, uh, or those. I mean, I'll be honest, when I eat way too much at uh, Thanksgiving or some other holiday season, when I have that huge meal, I take two digestive enzymes. And then I have a much better time. And I don't pay if I overdo it mm-hmm. as much. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think though they're kind of those are the places that you step on, but but reduce the problem with it and then add in enzymes. And it's gonna be particularly important to add in enzymes if you're a little bit older, because as we get older, we have less stomach acid, we have less pancreatic enzymes, and often we have less optimal bile production. Mm-hmm doesn't sound as though you are too concerned about high FODMAPs. Well, it really just depends on the case. So, I mean, I've seen SIBO cases where the person didn't respond to the low FODMAP diet whatsoever. And so you take another route and they respond to something else. So um, it really just depends on the person. Well, that's the importance of individualizing the treatment. I mean, we haven't done ourselves in any favor when we say that this works for all comers. It's never the case. It might work great in 50%, you know, 25% you need even more of whatever you're treating with and 25% would be better off without it entirely. So individualize. That's why, 
you know, black and white blanket statements. Sure, they're easy to do and they sound like you really know what you're doing, but just because you make it forcefully in a statement doesn't make it necessarily true for that individual. Mm -hmm. Do you have experience with a trantil? I do. Um, I don't find it to be that that effective, to be honest. I think if you're going to go the herbal route, there are a lot of better options. Um, so we actually, we haven't touched on this enough yet, but um, if you are hydrogen dominant, you're probably going to use something like berberine or coptis. Those types of things um, tend to be the most effective for the hydrogen dominant group. Um, for the methane dominant group, for herbal treatment, you're going to use allicin, which is... Um, garlic. It, yeah, it's garlic. It contains the medicinal part of garlic without the FODMAP bit. Um, and then again, you would use something like partially hydrolyzed guar gum if you tolerate it, um, because that does help to reduce the methanogens. And Allison's is, is quite of a, many people can reach for that and mm -hmm. they don't need a prescription. Exactly. And I don't think there's any really that, that it does any harm to. No, um, it seems to be kind of effective against all of them. And yeah. So, I mean, it's not a bad place to start. It might take you into that, you know, 30% better, 40% better. And now, well, I can do this mm -hmm. because I'm starting. Yeah, it's also antifungal and anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. um, helpful for the immune system. So it's kind of just a win-win with the- Yeah, it is. Uh, it's good for many, many things. Um, and, you know, or you can use the garlic. When I was in general practice, uh, there was the odd guy, usually of Eastern European descent, but he'd come in with a whole neck necklace of garlic mm. <laughs> and it's pretty powerful and impressive but it probably did make some difference mm -hmm. you know because it enhances the immune system and it backs down the excess of certain things mm -hmm. yeah there's a lot of uh, solutions in nature we've tried to make them very sound very sciencey and and academic but if we can use all the components in nature that's why the diversity of food your body gets to decide most often, well, that's really good for me. And that one's really good for me. That one's, that's not so good for me. Right? So you figure it out. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot less agreement about herbal treatments for the hydrogen sulfide group. Uh, one of the suggestions is emulsified oregano. So not just straight oregano oil, that's actually kind of irritating for the gut, um, but using emulsified oregano. And the only company I know of that's making it currently is Biotics Research. Um, some other uh, ingredients that might be helpful for reducing hydrogen sulfide would be um, some sort of formula that contains lemongrass. Um, there's also cinnamon bark extract, which could potentially be helpful. And then pomegranate rind, um, which is kind of newer for North America. So we don't have too many options in that department. But I do hope in the future that we start to see more tinctures and things with pomegranate rind over here. I've never eaten a pomegranate rind yet. I have the powder. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's bitter. I mean, typically, rinds yeah. are. There's no question. And yet, now we're using grapefruit seed extract, for example, and and we're using the rind of the pectin from the outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's there's a lot of pieces left in these, and sometimes we've abandoned them without good reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What brand of enzymes do you recommend? Um, well, I mean, we've talked about the fibrin reducing ones quite a bit, but I personally like Nutricology. I like the pancreas by Nutricology. Um, I find that that one's great for, I mean, a number of issues, especially if the person has compounded issues, like a lot of food sensitivities, or maybe they're sensitive to yeast or something like that. So they wouldn't be tolerant to um, like say the enzyme Medica enzymes, which come from bacteria or yeast. Um, so that's my preference. I don't know about you. Well, there's a big spectrum out there, and I've been really impressed. Usually, if the company is good quality and, and the other things they make, usually they make a very good enzyme, too. And so pick and choose. But if you're without a gallbladder, then I would get one with ox bile mm -hmm. in it because it's going to really smooth things out for you. And you can you almost always know when you're going to eat a fatty meal or have them with you. I think one of the other things you mentioned in notes the other day was, you know, say you're gluten and dairy sensitive and you're going out to dinner and well mm -hmm. once in a while you can't tell i mean you're not necessarily as acutely sensitive as a full-blown celiac but you still don't feel well if mm -hmm. you get some of those foods that are incorporated into the food that you're getting served in the restaurant and everybody's going to be so anxious to go to the restaurant when they can again that uh they're not going to be as careful so prepare you know 
have something with the enzymes that will help glucose. Uh, DPP4 mm. is one of the important groups in enzyme because that's lacking at least in about a third of people. You can get that measured now at Great Plains Labs. And if, if you're an individual lacking that, taking the extra enzyme helps reduce the problems that you would create because in, in those people with problem, they'll get a major inflammation spike. So now you're going to wake up stiff and sore tomorrow or it's going to flare up something for you. Mm -hmm. I know some of our clients really like bromelain, which comes from pineapple, and it's really great for also just reducing inflammation. Yeah. And we know that that digests things. If you eat a lot of raw pineapple and you feel like your tongue's being digested away, that's what's happening because it's working. Okay. So bromelain in modest amounts. And of course, easier if you can swallow it down and eating regular pineapple, just don't overdo it. Your tongue will disappear. Mm -hmm. What products can I use to heal leaky gut? Um, yeah, so you're right. L-glutamine has the most research behind it. Um, you actually need to take a fair bit, though. Um, some studies recommend up to 20 grams per day of L-glutamine if you're going to use it. Um, quercetin is another good one. Um, quercetin is also helpful for reducing histamine-producing microbes, if that's an issue for you. Um, colostrum is another really great one for healing leaky gut. Um, and then I would say butyrate as well. Uh, so if you have hydrogen dominant SIBO, then that the hydrogen sulfide, sorry, the hydrogen sulfide production, if you have hydrogen sulfide dominance actually disrupts your butyrate production, even if you have the presence of butyrate producing microbes. So it could potentially be helpful to supplement with butyrate. Yeah. And so the, those are very good suggestions, but don't aggravate the problem. Take mm -hmm. away some of the problems that might be triggering it. Get that glyphosate out of your diet. Yeah, exactly. And if you're in doubt about your glyphosate, then get it measured. You can get it measured personally on a urine sample. Not all that expensive. Great Plains Labs does it uh, in Lenexa, Kansas, and you can sign on and go through there. They will also test your water for glyphosate. So I think, you know, Dean, and we've talked a bit about that before from Australia, he was on these with me about four to six weeks ago before uh, Christina stepped in. And then we had him on as a guest last week. But, you know, he was astounded, but his glyphosate measured up 96, 97 percentile. OK, mine measured five. I've got friends in the prairies that measured 70, which they were a bit distressed about. And a young lad in Regina is measured 96 percentile. So you need to find out where it's coming from. It's in the water. I, I looked it up. It's in the rainfall. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be extra cautious what you're drinking and what you're supplying on your garden and everything else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the shortcut for reducing your glyphosate intake is avoid those desiccated or super dried out foods in preparation or for harvest. And those are wheat, sweet potatoes, potatoes, sugar beet, and sugar cane. So mm -hmm. short story, get into maple syrup. <laughs> I'm a big fan of maple syrup. Um, yeah, take your hand off the stove top if you want to heal your burn. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's right. Uh, That's a good analogy. I like that. Yeah. There are a couple other nutrients that are necessary for proper gut barrier homeostasis. Um, so vitamin A is really important. And vitamin A comes from things like cod liver, um, the orange vegetables like sweet potato or carrots. Yeah. Vitamin D is really important for your gut barrier as well. So make sure you get exposure, um, bare skin to sunlight or you're supplementing with vitamin D or using a vitamin D lamp. Um, and I actually heard a good saying about this one the other day as well from Dr. Jacoby's podcast. She was saying um, a good fence makes good neighbors. So in reference to um, your gut barrier. <laughs> well, well, of course, because it relies not just on your epithelial cells, the surface, but there's very much a team approach between the healthy commensal and particular bacteria and other microbes to make that a really good barrier. And it's the most important thing you can possibly do is heal that barrier, but you're shooting your cells in the foot anytime you reach like for an antibiotic, you need to take it for something else. Everything goes skewed out of system. Um, and, you know, anytime you've got a huge stress in your life, 
So get over your fear for COVID-19 because that huge stress, big cortisol stress, and now the patency or the holes within the leaky gut are aggravated. So it, it's very tied together. And that's why, you know, stress reduction, bringing in more gratitude in your life, you know, and gratitude is one of the things we mentioned for the seven things to improve and recover your brain in the ebook that we're making. Mm -hmm. We'll have available very soon um, because it's a not to be underestimated piece, whether that's breath techniques, mindfulness training, yoga, you know, the gamut is many, but please do one, two or three of those and find out which one works for you. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, I was going to say, oh, so we have Bruce asking questions, who is a dentist. And we actually had another dentist reach out to us as well um, about their gut health. And so I would like to just promote the hair tissue analysis again, because if you have a history of working in the dental industry, it, there's a pretty good chance that um, you have heavy metal toxicity or maybe some other form of toxicity. So you might want to um, not only do the hair tissue mineral analysis, but maybe do like a toxins panel um, to look at the level of solvents and and what sort of solvents you might be excreting because those things can all impact the gut as well and SIBO. Okay, so one of the questions from Nola is what is good with, and I think she means epilepsy, it's not quite, and MS. So there is some parallels in those two. There's no question if you have irritable nerves, then you're gonna be more prone to epilepsy, okay? Um, the, the parallel is, Often if there's a focused part of the brain that's irritated or inflamed, that can trigger epilepsy, you know, after an injury or, or any other spectrum of things. Or um, MS itself, of course, is a localized, it's excess inflammation in a particular part of the brain. The one thing that I like for both of those is hyperbaric oxygen, okay? Because the oxygen really brown, brings down the inflammation. And one of the most common reasons that they use hyperbaric oxygen in China is to treat epilepsy. So that's a little bit off the curve for what we're used to in North America. But if you ask me to have something that would treat both, then I would look at hyperbaric oxygen. I don't know about normal baric oxygen, which I've talked about, of course, before. I don't know where it fits in the treatment of epilepsy. Uh, I do know that when you have an epileptic event and you turn very blue, I'm pretty sure that's not good for the brain or any other part of the body because of the entity. And so then, you know, having oxygen to breathe in after immediately is probably not a bad idea. Um, you can't go too far wrong in the short term. So as far as diets, you know, I would very much recommend people that have both MS and epilepsy go gluten free. Why? Because there's already documented in the literature, and I've got seen one case myself, a fellow was 65, kept having grand mal seizures from his epilepsy. They initially said, well, you know, maybe this isn't really happening, but then he had one in an emergency room one day, and everybody observed it and said, yeah, grand mal seizure. And he figured out himself, if he stayed away from gluten, his seizure stayed away. And gluten isn't the whole trigger in MS, but it's one of the aggravating features. I would have no qualms about saying. So I think it's really smart to get off gluten if you have MS and epilepsy. And I would think very hard about going off casein 2, which is in the dairy component, because there's an 80% crossover. And I talk about that very much in the chapter on gluten in, in my book, Solving the Brain Puzzle, to really reduce the aggravating features that worsen your illness. Well, remember the manganese toxicity with the glyphosate as well. So manganese toxicity, which occurs due to um, glyphosate toxicity can actually promote seizures as well. Yeah, manganese we need, but we need it in fairly small amounts. If you get it in excessive amounts, it goes from a quality needed to a relative poison, okay? And it's very much like that way with anything. And then the, in the wrong place as well. So the glyphosate sends manganese to the brain instead of the gut or yeah. the bile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can aggravate those features. Okay. Well, we're actually, we're at two o'clock. So there maybe we, are. we just want to summarize what we talked about today. So today we, we've tried to talk about, you know, reassure people 
it's going to be okay to go back to normal. We may have some bumps along the road. The risk of you doing badly with COVID-19 are quite small. You can really dramatically help that with vitamin D, have some vitamin C on hand and take some regularly and those sorts of issues. Get your microbiome healthy. And part of getting your microbiome healthy is getting the small intestine portion to handle your SIBO, small mm -hmm. intestine bacterial overgrowth. And so we had a good question the other day from, from Bruce. And I think, you know, we will start to write more about the possibilities if you know you, you want to get your microbiome enhanced with gut floral transplant, that you're worried about your SIBO, then start out by talking to one of our people in consultation and then find out what might be the best pattern to do that in so that you could follow the treatment for the SIBO with fairly recent follow-up with the gut floral transplant. And now you've got new bacterial sources and new microbe sources to help resolve both problems. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. Um, well, that's it for today. Don't forget to share this video if you found it helpful. Um, share it with others in your community. That would be really helpful for us. And uh, we will see you next Tuesday. And it's also available at drbillcode.com mm -hmm. on a YouTube or soon under an audio podcast portion so you can take it with you. Okay. Bye for now.